21 primera Cátedra Europa, el Encuentro Académico y Cultural del Caribe Colombiano y el Mundo Académico Europeo. Europa se vive en el Caribe. Thank you very much for introducing me and uh, for giving uh, me the opportunity to uh, speak about uh, our research. Well, um, in, the, in recent years we did a lot of research on uh, competition and competitiveness. Well, that's uh, not unusual as an economist. Uh, this is what we do day, um, day by day. We talk about competition, but today we'll talk about uh, competitiveness, individual competitiveness, that is um, the preference for competitive situations where whether people like, uh, like uh, competition or not. And this is, uh, as I will show, not what uh, economists typically do. Well, what we know is that competition is a cornerstone of life. Well, you face competitive situations um, uh, all of the time. It starts in childhood, for example. Here we see the two boys engaged in arm wrestling. We don't know why they do it, maybe because it's fun. Then later in life, you have to work, you have to compete for the jobs, so the career uh, career choices are driven by competitiveness or by competitive situations. And of course, uh, best example might be sports, maybe sports. Here we see football players, uh, Hamas uh, playing for Bayern Munich, and they uh, try to win the Champions League. And this is a typical tournament. Only one team can win, or often only one person can win. And this is a clearly is a competitive situation. Yeah? And the question is now um, whether people differ yeah, with respect to their willingness to compete. I could ask you now, do you believe that some people are more competitive than others? And we will do this now, I will ask you, but not whether you think that other people are more competitive or whether they like competition or not, but whether you like competition or not. Here is a simple statement, I like situation in which, you, in which I compete with others. Or here, the Spanish translation, and I would like to ask you to use here this platform to answer that question or to assess yourself, be honest, try to say what, whether you strongly agree with that statement, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. El CAUT, que seguramente varios de ustedes conocen, eh, se pueden inscribir con cualquier nombre. Realmente la idea no es mirar quién contesta qué cosa, sino tener una idea general eh, qué tan competitivos somos aquí en este salón. Excelente, ya casi todos. ¿Faltan algunos? ¿Sí? Ya no se está moviendo mucho. A la una. A las dos. A las tres. Cuatro. <risa> y cinco y arrancamos entonces con la pregunta que acaba de hacer eh, Vena ustedes se consideran me gusta las situaciones en las que compito con otros
So, okay, what do we see? We see, first, thank you very much uh, for participating. So what we see is that most said, well, I agree, but I do not st strongly agree. Then you have many who agree. And here, at least uh, in this audience, only a few say that they strongly disagree with a statement or disagree. Uh, and um, we use this question, this um, st um, item, in a survey, uh, the so-called Flash Eurobarometer Entrepreneurship in 2009. Oops, in 2009. And um, we had more than uh, 26,000 people um, participating in that survey. And it was a survey uh, conducted in um, 36 uh, countries. And here you see how the general population in these countries, it was uh, representative, answer to that question. And here you see that depending on the country, uh, people, there's a lot of variation whether people strongly disagree, uh, agree or disagree. What you can see here is, for example, that Germany scores lower. So in contrast to what we found here in this audience, more people said, no, I don't want, I disagree or I uh, strongly disagree. No? And um, you see that at the top is Ireland, for example, where many people say, well, I agree or strongly disagree uh, with this statement. So they are uh, competitive or think that they are competitive, that they like competitive situations. Uh, but what we see is that there's a lot of variation. Some people like it, some people don't like it. Here, this is ab about the countries in the European Union. Here we have other countries. And here, one interesting finding is that we have, for example, the US. And here you can see in the US, 41% and 36% uh, say, I strongly agree or agree, agree with this statement. So they seem to be, at least from their perspective, own perspective, own, elevation, uh, own evaluation, very, um, very uh, competitive. In contrast, Japan scores quite low. Uh, quite low you know? So what does this tell us if we believe that people tell us the truth, you know, that you told us the truth, whether you feel that you are competitive or not, that gives the first empirical evidence that there's heterogeneity with respect to competitiveness. You know, that some people, and we may call it or understand it as the general tendency to favor competitive environments over non-competitive environments. And the interesting thing is that this kind of question or item is used in psychological research. Yeah, we have obtained that from um, psychological research. And in psychological research, it is accepted, fully accepted, that people differ, that there is a heterogeneity with respect to competitiveness. Some people are more competitive, other people are less competitive. So it is accepted in that discipline. And they focus, for example, then on the question, what do we really mean by competitive, uh, competitiveness? Is it enjoyment of competition? Is it the desire to win? Or do people want to develop in competition? And now comes the surprising fact. Yeah? You would expect that economists deal with this problem too, or investigate the uh, competitiveness of people. But this is not what economists did for a long time. For a long time, Competitive, uh, competitiveness, the preference for competitive situation was completely neglected. Uh, and only, and the explanation for that is that economists, at least in standard uh, economics, in mainstream economics, they focused on profit maximization, utility maximization. It's all about outcomes, not processes. Uh, and people maximize the outcome. They don't care whether there is competition or not. Of course, competition has an impact on the outcomes, but it was not analyzed whether people like it or don't like it. And uh, more recently, since 10 years, there are studies, especially experimental studies, analyzing the competitiveness of people, preferences for competition. And this is mainly done in the context of gender differences. These studies focus on gender and say, okay, if there's heterogeneity, is there a heterogeneity between um, men and women. And what these uh, studies show is that women are more reluctant than men to engage in competitive situations yeah, in laboratory experiments. I use uh, in a study the data set, the flash barometer data set that I described um, 
I mentioned a few minutes ago, and I found that gender differences yeah, in the self-report are statistically significant in almost all of the 36 countries, and there's considerable, considerable variation in the magnitude, however. Okay, so it seems that there is heterogeneity. It seems that there is a difference between men and women. What, but why should we care? Why could it be of interest whether there's heterogeneity or not? And the idea here is, or what a recent study shows, is that it is relevant because it may affect career choices. Now, if individuals have to decide, men and women, whether they enter a job, whether they choose a certain career, then they may take into account the intensity of competition in this environment. And recent economic studies, uh, experimental studies, show that, for example, school students choose a different academic career track depending on their competitiveness, or that women shy away from competitive work settings. That was a field study where they somehow uh, manipulated, uh, uh, they advertised uh, job openings and then they manipulated the intensity of competition. And uh, in an own study here, again based on the flash barometer entrepreneurship, we found that the difference in the self-reported competitiveness explains or at least is associated with the gender gap in latent entrepreneurship, whether they favor self-employment over um, uh, uh, paid employment, and with nascent entrepreneurship, that means with the starting of businesses, with the probability of starting a business. So there is some external validity for that, um, for competitiveness. competitiveness. It seems to play a role. And then the next question is, well, where does it come from? And there are studies showing that competitiveness, the preference for competition, has a strong, or that culture plays a role here, that socialization plays a role, and that is what we would expect, that this is the main driver of competitiveness, whether people are competitive or not. But what we are interested, uh, we were interested in, at least in one research project, was the question, is there a biological route? Yeah? In a more general way, we can ask, do biological factors influence human behavior and psychological characteristics? And there are two types of literature here. The one uh, talks about genes, DNA. For example, is there a relationship between DNA and entrepreneurship? There are studies on the market. But we focused on hormones and not on current uh, hormone levels. This is fluctuating. We can measure it in our blood or saliva. There it is uh, varies over, uh, over the time day by day or per month, you can see over the months, you can see uh, levels changing. But we focused on prenatal androgen exposure. That is the exposure in mother's womb, in utero. Yeah? Babies in mother's womb are exposed to androgens, and the most uh, well-known are testosterone and, um, uh, and uh, is the testosterone. And uh, the question is, does this prenatal androgen, uh, androgen exposure influence individual competitiveness? So what could be the causal link here yeah, for uh, this effect? And what the uh, literature in human biology says is that this exposure yeah, to testosterone leads to a masculinization of the brain. Yeah? And if we believe that, there are other studies saying that this organizational effect on the brain leads to uh, sexually differentiated behavior. So people with a more masculinated brain because of PAE exposure, uh, PAE exposure uh, in, uh, in utero are more masculine in their behavior. Now, that is uh, the idea here. And now I will ask you again to participate in a, um, in a survey. Here you see the right hand, and you see the finger length. And now I would like to ask you to check your finger length. Yeah? Again, we can use this um, tool. Just look at your fingers of the right hand, check the index finger, check the ring finger, and check whether they are equal, whether index finger is longer, or whether the ring finger is longer. Sounds a little bit weird. It is weird, but uh, let's see. Todavía están todos eh, inscritos en el caos. Ay, no. Ya se tocaba hacerlo otra vez. 
un momento toca arrancar nuevamente que por alguna razón siguió. Vamos a hacer un skip a la primera pregunta que ya contestaron, ¿sí? Pero necesito que por favor se vuelven a inscribir, qué pena con ustedes. Nuevamente, da igual con cuál nombre, que la única cosa que queremos realmente saber, ya que sabemos que son altamente competitivos, si sí, eso tiene que ver con sus marcas. O si tenemos algo aquí especial para Colombia, ¿no? More than the first one? Oh. <laughs> sí, ya tenemos más que bien. <laughs> Listo, arrancamos otra vez a la una, a las dos, a las tres, a las cuatro y a las cinco. Perfecto, como les dije, vamos a skip esta pregunta. Espero que se pueda. Y, por favor, únicamente las mujeres con sexo, ningún hombre, ¿sí? Ya llegamos a los hombres. Las mujeres, únicamente. Ya <laughs> yeah, to 100% that can't be true. <laughs> So what we see here is that uh, for women, most said the, uh, this is equal. Yeah? The index finger has the same length as the ring finger. Uh, and then we see that some have a high ratio, others have a low ratio, but the majority has of women has a high ratio or an equal ratio. Okay, now we do the same thing for the men. Ahora sí, los chicos. Y I'm really curious whether we will see what I expect, but <laughs> this is research, you never know. Okay. So what we see is here, equal is much lower. What we see is uh, that we have a low ratio, which is much lower. This is for me surprising, and I will say uh, why this high ratio among males. But what we see here is that at least here, more males, uh, the males have predominantly equal or lower um, ratios. So, and now I think you want to know Why I ask that? Why do why I'm interested in the finger length? Well, there's a there's an idea that the measurement of this finger length ratio, and that is called 2D40 in the literature, and the, here it is how it is measured exactly. This is the ratio of the index finger to the ring finger. If the ratio is one, then it is equal, of course. If the ratio, if the ring finger is longer than the index finger, then the ratio is below one. And of course, if, if the index finger is longer, then the ratio is above one. So why is it interesting? Well, what we see, and in principle we could see it here also, is that most women have an equal ratio. And this is what we saw here in the audience. The very feminine ratio is if uh, this is high, and a very masculine ratio is if it is low, so below one. Yeah? And uh, this is uh, what you find again and again 
Uh, and the interesting point here is that this finger erasure is, uh, develops in utero and it does not change over time. Yeah? So why is that interesting? Well, what we believe is, or what is believed is that this finger uh, ratio, that this um, 2 d 40 ratio, is a uh, non-invasive retrospective biological marker of prenatal androgen exposure. So if you are exposed in, in utero as a fetus to testosterone, then the higher the testosterone, the lower the ratio, the more masculine is this finger ratio. Yeah? And what we see is, again, what we see is there's a difference, a stable difference between males and females. And it is said that this is a lifelong signature of prenatal sex hormonal exposure. But there's a question mark because you cannot really test it. Yeah? This is for ethical reasons. You can't test whether more testosterone leads to different digit ratios. So what they did in uh, human biology research, they tried to find indirect evidence. For example, uh, they used zygotic spillovers between zygotic uh, twins. In utero, they uh, measured amniotic uh, fluid. Uh, they tried to uh, find out whether certain uh, hormone syndromes uh, affect the ratio, like the Klinefelter syndrome. There is some evidence, but all the research is based on small samples. Uh, and the uh, evidence is mixed, but there's other evidence. Uh, they did experiments with non-human uh, mammals like rats and mice, and there it seems that this effect holds, that there is an impact of prenatal uh, androgen uh, exposure on finger length. No? And it seems to be unrelated to circulating testosterone. And this is from, the, from an economist's point of view, uh, someone, someone who... Uh, does empirical research, this is great because it's exogenous. It's given, it does not change over time. So you can be sure that there's no reverse of causality of you do something and then the finger ratio changes. No, it's there, but we have to check whether there's a relationship with behaviors. And this is the starting point of the second part. Jim Urbeck will talk about our own approach to this, uh, or our own contribution to this research. So to sum up, well, what we find is there's empirical evidence for heterogeneity in individual competitiveness between countries, in countries, we saw it here in the audience. We know that there is, uh, that individual competitiveness is found to be sexually dimorphic. On average, not always, but on average, um, men are more competitively inclined than, uh, inclined than women. And 2D40 tends to be associated especially with sex typical, uh, typical behaviors. And that leads to our research question, are men and women with lower digit ratios more competitive? And now Dimo will take over and talk about this. Thank you for having us here. And I will now go to the empirical part of the studies. So instead of going to you in the classroom, we basically went also to a big shopping mall and basically did the same. We asked people to play games with us, to respond to questions, and we measured their finger lengths. And then we checked, actually, the relationship. We did that also with university students in the classroom. Um, there's a basic reason behind that. If we want to look at the effect of prenatal testosterone exposure, there might be a benefit of not being too old. Because over time, you learn many things. You get socialized and so on. And some of your prenatal dispositions might be overwritten. So it might be useful, actually, to start studying that stuff with young people who have not been exposed to, like, exposed to so many experiences and social norms and so on. Well, how does it look like? Big shopping mall. And we were then staying in the middle of that shopping mall and trying to attract people to participate in our study. Well, we even made it in the local newspaper with that study. So simple idea, but big visibility. So what did we do? How do we get an understanding of how competitive people are? You have already seen that. We couldn't simply ask you, and we did that. 
So we ask, I like situations in which I compete with others. That gives us a general attitude. So it's not very specific. We have not asked you whether you like competition in your career, in study, in gambling, in games, in sports. No, very general. And the idea behind that is rather simple. Biology is very basic. And probably when nature has created our genes and, and all our body, you know, nature has not thought about playing tennis. So there will, is probably no mechanism built into our body that says, in tennis, you will be very competitive. But it's likely to be a more very general characteristic. Well, economists don't believe in this cheap, potentially cheap talk. They only want to look at real behavior. So they go, they put their people into a laboratory often into, into such cubicles with computers, and then they play with you. They play with you games and they look whether or not you play in a competitive, in a more competitive or in a less competitive way. Well, we did that with students, similar to that, but in our shopping mall we did it rather simple. You know, if you think how to implement such games, you don't need a computer. You know, a simple thing, a watch, some cards, a dice, and you can start your experiment. Well, the difference between the two is that with such a game, we observe a very specific behavior. And your experiences, you know, might have distorted already the influence of your biological dispositions. You might not perceive it as a competitive thing, as a competitive game, and so on. So there are lots of particularities you have to keep in mind when you watch people's behavior in a very single and abstract, isolated environment. So it might be really the case that we observe different things here and here. We have studied with Werner Brandt and colleagues how these two things are related to one another. They are related, but we can also show that there are substantial differences between both responses, between what you say and what you do in this particular game. You will see how this game will look like soon. So when we want to compete, we need to have something on which we compete, right? A task, something we can perform. So with our, within the shopping mall, actually, the participants validated math equations, simple ones. You see them here. For these equations, they basically have to say whether they are wrong or right. And they receive points for that. In the classroom where we run that experiment, you know, they had to check trivia questions. Like which of the following countries has the longest coast? Italy, Norway, France, Spain. Okay, it's a bit European centered, sorry for that. Um, for you, the question is probably more difficult, but again, one point for a correct and minus one point for a wrong answer. So you perform. In both cases, there's a performance. Now we ask the, the students as well as in the shopping mall, the people, how do you want to get paid for that? So we invited all of them to participate in the game to earn money. The good thing is we allowed them to opt themselves for what kind of payment they receive. We offered them either 25 cents per point or 50, 50 cent per point if they are better than another person. And if they are not better than another person, they receive zero. That basically is assumed to be the less competitive choice, and that is assumed to be the more competitive choice. Again, all that was done with cards, and your competitors actually had written their performances on cards, and we could compare it with them. So that's the setup how we measure competition. We also needed to measure the finger lengths. So the optimal measure, well, we don't know what it is. There are some discussions whether we have to x-ray that or scan the hand, the whole hand, and then measure it on the computer, or use what we did, an electronic, an electronic caliper. So actually what we did in the shopping mall is using this caliper with gloves at the hand because we touch people and so on. It, by the way, we just gave them two euro and they participated. They didn't care that much about it. 
So the two euro was enough for them to actually let, their, let them allow us to measure their finger lengths. Well, with students in the classroom, this is really a difficult thing. You know, already here with a, you know, what was it, about 100, 120 people, should we go from one to one and measure how long does that take? It's not very suitable. So actually, my colleague developed an idea which is pretty simple, but worked very well for this, what we wanted to do. He printed rulers on the paper of a survey and asked students to put their fingers on it, draw a line, and write down the numbers they see. Of course, this is extremely error prone. Yeah, but there's a nice thing. You could, on one page, measure these two fingers. And on another page, you measure these two fingers. And you see what happens? You measure the middle finger twice. And then you could just compare whether the length of the middle finger was rather equal, then it's OK. If they're extremely unequal, probably there is some measurement error. So we can actually increase the reliability of our measurements and exclude data points where students did some, might have made some mistakes. Well, both work very well. We can replicate typical patterns of these finger lengths in both samples. So obviously, and we see that the variation with this method is slightly bigger. This is what you probably are most interested in now. That's the result. How are these two things related. So these scientifically looking figures um, plot a distribution of finger lengths. So we look at a specific group of people and just plot, plot how often a particular finger length occurs. So you see the typical normal distribution, it's so nice, and the bold line are the highly competitive people. So it's the people who are have either indic have indicated that they're more competitive in our self-reported measure. So I start with the self-reported one because that's the more easier one. And we see that those who have indicated they are not so uncompetitive have on average higher finger, longer, uh, higher finger ratios. So actually that supports our idea that there is a systematic relationship between the finger ratio and the competitiveness. By the way, the good thing is that in the classroom experiment with the students, the same effect appears. So it's not just a particular random accident that we probably perhaps randomly observed in the shopping mall, but it's replicated in two distinct samples. So far, so nice. The behavior in the game is not at all related to the finger lengths. There's no systematic deviation in finger lengths between people who choose the competitive payment or the non-competitive payment. Frankly, we have no idea why. We have some speculation, and we are thinking about and currently explore multiple explanations for this. It might be the case, as I already indicated that the behavior is very specific and people do not consider it a, comp a real competition. You know, this simple game there, you know, this is not a relevant competition. So they don't care about it that much. They randomly answer whatever. It might also be the case, which would be not so nice for us, that actually the finger ratio is not related to competitiveness, but perhaps related to how you respond to questions. This is an honest interpretation. We don't know. But at least our study indicates that there is something out there. We have done a lot of ex additional analyses with this data. And the effect remains robust. And to the extent that I just said to you, it might be related to the way you respond to questions, we have also controlled for that. And this explanation we can exclude. So we are left at the end with a conflicting result. If we look at the general competitiveness of people, there is a relationship. 
if we look at the very specific behavior, there is no relationship. Consistently, again, through both samples. By the way, and just as a remark, it is indeed the case in the shopping mall that the effect is stronger for the very young people. So again, suggesting that our reasoning is somewhat meaningful. Well, that's the empirical part of our study. You see, with sometimes very simple tools, like uh, you now a dice and, and paper, you can run interesting studies. You just have to make sure that you reduce measurement errors and all that kind of stuff. Well, what do we learn? Individual competitiveness seems to be relevant for our life. And the heterogeneity and competitiveness seems to be related to biology. So there's still a lot of open questions here. And there's a lot of room for potential future research. This distinction between general or specific competitiveness, as well as, you know, what is really captured by the self-reported measurement? We don't know. So if you want to do research in the future, and we have published these studies, there is a way to continue along these lines and to publish your own contribution to this kind of research. Thank you very much. We are open to questions, I think. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so any question? No question. Great. Show me your fingers. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. If there's no question anymore, I think we stop here. Thank you. Vigésima primera Cátedra Europa, el encuentro académico y cultural del Caribe colombiano y el mundo académico europeo. Europa se vive en el Caribe.